John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones, and there were a lot of stones, by the way, to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands, and he will clear the threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the shaft will be burned with unquenchable fire. Am I the only one who hears the fire and brimstone indictment, who reads the Turner Burn sermon of John the Baptist in Matthew and go, you know, that's a bit much. <clears throat> Anyone read these words and wonder, you know, is God really this angry? Is God really this judgmental? If, is God really a God who, who gives up on his people and just goes cutting them down like trees and throwing them into the burn pile? Am I even allowed to ask the question, is God's ego so fragile that God feels the need to be this reactive? All seems a little heavy-handed, doesn't it? Is God so quick to anger, so abounding in wrath? And what do these passages mean about us, right? Are we in divine jeopardy? Are we that bad? I mean, true, I admit. I've been a sinner at least since the first time I snuck a candy bar out of the marketeria grocery store when I was in grade school. I got caught, by the way. My dad made me take it back and apologize to the store owner. I never did it again, let me tell you. That was embarrassing. But am I really that bad? Are you that bad? Does who we are so inflame God that God would just as soon sweep us into the rubbish fire. I mean, Christmas is only a few weeks away. And we've got angels coming, right? And shepherds and young mothers and little babies and animals in a manger. And we've got all this talk coming up about God being love and all of that stuff. But here's John, right? Out by that riverside talking fire and brimstone, creates kind of a dilemma. Because we affirm, don't we, that in some way, the same God that John the Baptist is talking about in his fire sermon is the same God who, who comes to us in Christ. Most of us believe that when, it, when you really get down to the core of who God is, God is less like the wrathful axe wielder of John the Baptist and more like Jesus. But this seems to be at least a component of who God is, and we cannot simply ignore it. We don't like this part of the story. We would love to ignore the brash, unruly, scruffy prophet, good old John the Baptizer and his message, and just get straight to the love stuff. But here we are. Welcome to Advent. So we are in Advent preparing for arrival. But as we mentioned last week, and as we well know, 
we are preparing for an arrival in kind of a dark time. The season of Advent always, always has this somber tone which reminds us that all is not necessarily well in the world. For this world which awaits the arrival is, as John reminds us in his gospel, not John the Baptist, but John the mystic, more than a little dark. In fact, John says, the people are dwelling in darkness. Dwelling in darkness. We get that. It rings true. Things are a mess. More than a mess. And it's because this is true that this passage is what we get as we think about the arrival of Christ. And because it is true, we also have that passage from Isaiah that we heard earlier. The passage from Isaiah, which we love, and it's got all that wonderful stuff in it, how does it start? It starts with a stump. Think about that. It starts with a stump. It starts with a gross, ugly, clear cut. Not a lush forest. And of course, John the Baptist starts Jesus' ministry not with nice, kind, wonderful, sweet words, but with fire and brimstone. There is a hint, more than a hint, in this passage from Matthew and the passage from Isaiah, that if things are going to get better, if things are going to change, somehow we have to change. Given the imagery, perhaps a little pruning is in, in place, right? Given the imagery, perhaps more than a little pruning. Perhaps pruning is not even enough. The axe is at the root of the tree. In Isaiah, the image of the shoot growing up out of the stump presupposes that a tree was chopped down to a stump. And only when that happened could the new shoot grow up out of it. The tree had to be taken down to almost nothing. And John the Baptist is nothing if not blunt, right? Again, we have axes, and we have trees, and we have stumps. The axe is lying at the root of the trees. John is purposely trying to shock the people here. He's trying to push them out of their complacency and call them to chop down, to root out, all the old habits, all the old behaviors of greed and shame and selflessness that have grown up in their souls. Both of these passages and the images in them have an underlying message behind them. We have to do some clearing. We have to do some cleansing. We have to get rid of some stuff. We have to clear our souls if we would be ready for the arrival of the one who is to come. Something has to be chopped down. Something has to be thrown away in order for there to be room for this new shoot of Jesse to sprout. Something has to be removed. Something has to be done so that we can be healthy trees who bear good fruit. This all leads us to what I think is probably the first great question of Advent. After we have declared that something, someone is coming, what do we need to do to get ready? What do we need to do to prepare the way for the Lord? Both in Isaiah and in the story of John the Baptist. What needs to be done is, is pretty much wrapped up in a term that we often use, probably without really even thinking a whole lot about what it actually means. Repentance. That's the word that John uses directly. So let me do a little word association here. Let me ask you a question. When you hear the word repentance, what pops into your head? What are the, what are the other words that pop into your head? Okay. Go in the other direction. Go in the other direction. Forgiveness. Be sorry. Be sorry. <laughs> right? So... 
all kinds of words pop in our heads. Forgiveness, certainly, but also, right, sin. How many of you thought about sin or guilt when you hear about repentance? Something needs to change, right? Something's not right. A lot of people, I think, jump to sin. We kind of have this sin thing down. I mean, we understand that we're not perfect. We understand that we do things that aren't great. We understand that, that there's things happening around us that aren't within what God has planned. We understand that. We know things are kind of me- mixed up and messed up. You know, we all have those places where it's not working. I have my places, you have yours. Now, when we think about the word sin, which is a, tr- a word probably only the church uses. When we think about the word sin, we all have our own ideas about what's sinful and what's not, right? In fact, Christians today can't even begin to agree on what behaviors are sinful and what behaviors are not. But again, we just know that something is not quite right. And we know that we think things, and we know that we say things, and we know that we do things that aren't quite right, and thus hurt us and hurt us other people. That's why the Advent hymns are so dark and broody, right? They drip with despair and words about bondages. We're good at noticing the things that are wrong about us. We kind of know that it's there, and we know the damage that we do, and we see it play out every day, right? We see hate. We see the lust. We see the greed. We see the racism. We see the violence. We see the indifference toward the poor. We see the acceptance of repression and inequity. We see that stuff all around us in today's America. We see it in pending cuts to services for the poor and the elderly. We see it in the unacceptable treatment, in my opinion, of the protesters at Standing Rock. We see it all kinds of places. Most of the time, it's not dramatic, but it's there. Most of the time, it's little stuff. But that little stuff, too, is important. We may be average sinners. We may be mediocre sinners. You know, kind of -of run-of-the-mail, cheat on your taxes, fall asleep watching Game of Thrones, not taking time to listen to our kids kind of sinners. But we're still sinners, and we still have these issues, and there's still places where we're off track, where we miss the mark, and there's still ways in which we hurt other people and we hurt ourselves, And so we are all a bit like elm trees with Dutch elm disease. So something has to change. When John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing on the banks of the Jordan, those who came to him were for the most part people who knew they had issues and wanted to change. That's why they were there. This was the baptism of repentance. You didn't have to be baptized to get into the club if you were a a person, a Jewish person. You were born into the race. You just were a Jew. You were part of the family. And baptism wasn't one of their rights. But baptism of repentance that John brought forth here was this baptism that came from the Essenes, the people out in the desert, uh, the aesthetics, who said, you know, we're just really not living up to our heritage, to our birthright, and sometimes we need to be cleansed, we need to kind of start over. So this baptism of repentance came out of places like Qumran, And John the Baptist, coming out of a place like Qumran, comes out of the desert and brings it into the mainstream of society and says, we need, as a people, to change. We need to turn around, go a different direction. So let's have this baptism of repentance to symbolize that change. So all of these people are coming, and he's baptizing them. And then all of a sudden, he looks over, and he sees the Sadducees and the Pharisees standing there in line with everybody else getting ready to be baptized. And you might think he would go, yes, cool, all right, way to go, guys. They're guys. But instead he looks at them and he goes, you brood of vipers with hearts of stone. What? I mean, that's not exactly what it takes to get somebody to actually go in and get baptized, right? But that's what he says. Why? I think he said it because he realized that they really needed to change, but they didn't really believe it. 
They might have thought they needed some minor adjustments, but for the most part, these people were pretty pleased with themselves. Because these were Sadducees, the rich ones, the blessed ones. These were the, the Sadducees were the 1% of Israel. Okay? And the, and, the, and the Pharisees were like the ultra super righteous of Israel. So we have the righteous people, the, God, the, the God's defenders. We have the rich people, those who have been blessed by God because they're the privileged ones. And they're standing in line, and at some level, they are not ready to change. And so John sees them and he roars, you offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring fruit worthy of repentance. Bring forth fruit. You know, like a little generosity maybe, or a little humility, or a little compassion for the poor. That would be nice. So these people needed to change like everybody else, but they were not ready to change. They needed a little motivational interviewing. Because John sensed that they were not going to change, that they would leave the desert, go back to the city, still follow themselves. They would go back with all their old beliefs and biases intact. They would go back with their amazing level of arrogance and their amazing level of judgmentalism intact, and nothing would be different. And so he said, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, change. John was saying you have to be open to radical change. Saying it to all of them. You have to be ready for change. You have to be ready to let God flow into your life in such a way that your life bears the fruits that indicates the Spirit's presence. Of course, then there was also that or else. Right? Or else you get cut down and thrown into the fire. That, I think, was John saying sometimes... Sometimes you are so rigid, so blocked, so locked that you won't let change happen. And when you're in that, in that place, it may take something big to break through all of the barriers, to break things open, to create the opportunity for God to do God's new thing. The tree in Isaiah had to be taken down to a stump so the sprout could come up. The, these rigid people of God needed to be broken open and poured out so that the way of Jesus could take root and sprout in their lives. And I think there's a truth here, isn't there? I mean, don't we kind of know that a lot of times growth comes out of pain? We know that. And we know that there's going to be pain. There's going to be difficult moments. <clears throat> and when John is saying, there, there may be some pruning. The whole tree may need to come down. You may need to have to face some things you don't want to face. You may need to Deal with the consequences of who you are and what you've done. That may need to hit you between the eyes in order for you to be ready to change. You may need to suffer loss in order to be ready to change. You may need to be stripped down to almost nothing in order to be ready to change. You may need to hit bottom, become a stump. Addicts know what I'm talking about. Right? Before the newness of God can really come into your life and you experience change. That newness often comes out of pain is true whether the pain is self-inflicted or whether it's just life happening to us. In the end, both of these passages present us with some significant spiritual challenges. They tell us we must be willing to look in the mirror. We must be willing to face up to the totality of who we are, good and bad, sane and sinner. I'm not saying we need to wallow in guilt. In fact, I would not say that. We are not asked to beat ourselves up. We're just asked to be honest with ourselves and God. They tell us, second, that we have to be willing to be touched deeply, profoundly, radically, impacted at the core of who we are. We have to be willing, if necessary, to be cut down to stump level, if that's what it takes. Both of these passages start with discomfort. In Isaiah, we start with the discomfort of Israel remembering that they're a stump. They were once a proud nation, right? Under David, under Solomon, even under some of the other kings. But they had been cut down to nothing. They'd been cut down to nothing because they did not build their kingdom according to God's design. This is the message of the prophets. They were, the rich were too greedy. 
The powerful were too oppressive. The poor were neglected. There was injustice all over the place, and God simply wasn't a priority. Read any of the prophets in the Old Testament, any of them, and you'll find that theme repeated again and again and again. Too much greed, too much injustice, too much neglect of the poor. And, by the way, the immigrant. And their choices to, to live that way, to follow wicked kings, to, to go down that path and neglect the call of God to protect the vulnerable and take care of the needy and all of that stuff, that cost them. They lost their land. They ended up in exile. It was stump time. Okay? When they heard the words of Isaiah about that stump, they knew exactly what Isaiah was talking about. Believe me. And in Matthew, we have that discomfort of the people of Israel facing this wild, brayish man of the desert who told it like it was and basically said, you got to want it worse than this. And here's the thing. Both of these passages end with radical hope. Both of them. In Isaiah, the sprout springs forth from the dead stump, and we get a new tree full of promise and a new beginning. A new beginning that actually culminates in a new world, and it's quite a world, isn't it, right? Because the wolf lives with the lamb, and the leopard lies down with the goat, and the calf, and the lion, and the yearling are together. And nobody's destroying anybody. Wow. That's what comes up out of the stump. In Matthew, John is the baptizer washes the people with water, and he promises them that while he's washing them with water and doing this kind of surface thing, they're going to be washed and filled with the power of God. And that all things will become fresh and new. And many, many years later, Paul, in 2 Corinthians, says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, see, the new has come. The promise is there, isn't it? The promise is clear. It's just getting there to the promise. That's tough. It suggested that getting to the promise is not always easy, that it does involve cost, that it does involve seeing ourselves honestly, both the good and the bad. It does involve our being willing to cut out of our lives the things that keep us from being fruitful people. And cutting out of our lives the priorities that cause us not to be fruitful people. It involves letting go of things that we cling to very tightly. Old beliefs, old values, old hurts, old failures, old expectations. Getting to the promise is difficult. And as we struggle toward the promise, we worry, right? As that pruning begins and we're not having a very good time, we're worried that we're going to be depleted. We're not going to be able to do this. We worry that we're going to end up barren stumps. We worry that our sins are too big. We worry that God really, ultimately, is a God of anger and is all about judgment and punishment. But the promise is clear. Even when things feel grim, even when things feel dire, we do not have, in John's preaching or in, any, in Isaiah's preaching, we do not have a message of doom. We do not. We have a message of liberation. We have a message that says, we can get our freedom from the thick, choking overgrowth of crud that has trapped us into misery and hopelessness. We can get freed from greed. We can get free from hate. We can get free from all of that stuff. We have the promise that we can get free and that even though right now things seem like they're a mess and things may get worse before they get better, we have the promise that we can be and will be set free. That is the message. We can and will be set free. Set free to embrace no more to be God's new thing. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for, we kind of thank you for John the Baptist. He's kind of tough. And his words are difficult to swallow. He didn't pull any punches. But we thank, are thankful that even though John the Baptist was so confrontive, he didn't forget grace. 
He didn't forget the message that someone was coming. He did not forget the message that we would be helped and empowered to be new people. We thank you for Isaiah and for his amazing poetry. We thank you for the stump out of which comes a shoot. We thank you for the image of the peaceable kingdom. Lord, we need a few things to hold on to, so help us to hold on to the promise and work our way through the difficult times as we head that direction, that we might truly remember that we are your new thing, new creations. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You'll turn in your hymnals to 